Okay, so this is the box of all the clothes that Michaela had on when I first saw her or brought her home from China. She had on a gray army jacket, kind of, when they, I first met her, but then when I said yes, I would take her, <laughs> adopt her, they put on a happy coat that her foster mother made for her. It's really an interesting fabric. My understanding is that if you live south of the Yangtze River, you don't get central heat. And so since it was end of January, 1st of February, it was cold. So here are the shirts she had on. One, two, and they still kind of smell even if they've been washed. Three, four, and then her pants. Here's what was on the bottom layer and they all have no crotch. So all of this was on her little body. Hi, my name is Michaela Gesford. I am currently 32 years old. I was actually born in China and then I came to America in 1994 when I was two years old. I've always been told the same story about how I got to the orphanage, which is, oh, you were abandoned in this random spot in a basket and you had a piece of paper with you that had your name written on it, Fu Ting, and your birth date, May 12th, 1992. And someone picked you up and took you to the closest orphanage and that's how you got there. I don't believe that at all. <laughs> I think it's complete and utter bullshit, actually because pretty much all of my adoptee friends say that they were told the same story. There are so many other things that were happening in the country at the time and in the different villages and, and cities and stuff with each baby that there's no way that that story is true for all of us. I think it's just the easiest one. The other reason why I don't believe it's true is because I don't even know if I was ever given a name by my biological parents because I'm also not even sure at what point I was taken to, handed to, delivered to, sold to, whatever, the orphanage. I kind of feel like I'll never know unless I find them and ask. You don't know when to talk about them. Being an educator, kids are my life. I always imagined and dreamed of being a mom. Prince Charming didn't ring the doorbell. You know, after a lot of thinking and a lot of considerations, I decided to go ahead and go through with an adoption. The process was pretty easy. I mean, I did have to have doctor's permit slips. I had to have something from the district. They came to visit me in the home. There was a lot of waiting. When I finally got the call, I got the call on Martin Luther King Day, and I left the next Monday. The U.S. tradition of it, having a baby shower, we had three. We had three parties to welcome her. Growing up, Lebanon, Oregon is a pretty small town. Like it's very much in the country. So pretty much in all of my classes growing up, I was the only Asian, not only the only Asian, but sometimes the only person of color in my class, which was pretty challenging. I distinctly remember sometimes some kids asking me questions that they didn't realize was bullying or wrong in any kind of way. Things like, oh, how much did you cost? Or they would demand that I say something in Chinese to them and I couldn't articulate it, that it hurt that they would ask me those questions. I don't remember her ever complaining about any racial slurs, but I'm sure it happened. And she just wasn't comfortable sharing or chose not to share. My mom's reaction at the time surprised me a little bit because she was shocked. How could you have experienced racism? I love you so much. And I'm like, I know you love me but your love does not protect me from experiencing these kinds of things when that's not how the world works. You know, I'm sure it happened, but not in front of me. <laughs> I think I was just a very chill child, but I think it was also because I was afraid of repercussions if I wasn't anything like that. And I was constantly around adults. This was also during the time when we didn't have internet. 
So I wasn't connected to a bunch of other kids socially, online, or anything like that, like people are now. I was trying to relate to people who were much older than me. And so I felt like I had to become an adult really quickly. I guess I remember her being, at first, of course, pretty quiet, but she was very observant. I mean, you could just see it in her eyes. She was taking it all in and analyzing all of us and thinking, you know, about the situation. So I remember her laughing, I guess. So being really quiet at first, but then, you know, two years she, later, she was laughing and talking and running up and down the hallway with my, my son. And I remember seeing her one time, another time when she was pretty serious, she was all in her ballet, or on the, maybe on the way. But I remember her, she was just very, um, held herself. My experience growing up a lot, I had a really hard time understanding my own emotions because I suppressed them so much. And so it's hard for me to recall how I felt because I think I was just numb. Come in. Come in. Come in. Let's go. <laughs> the Polly POV. <laughs> come on, Polly, come on. Let's go, let's go. Come on, come on. My parents are white and I'm Chinese, so it was very clear that we were not the same and that I was adopted. And I even remember when I was little, every time I saw like an Asian family, I would always think about like, wow, I look like I'm supposed to be their child, not my parents' child. So just really, longing to have those racial mirrors that that didn't exist in my daily life. I adopted her from an organization that rescues dogs from Puerto Rico. But I also kind of connected a lot with her story too because like I guess she's like an adoptee too. <laughs> and kind of like she had like a whole nother life before I got her because she was um four when I got her like she had a different name and like everything. Oh, guys coming at 1.30, but it takes us like an hour and a half to move. I don't like going on Sundays. I know, the Friday afternoons is better. Do you want, uh, you want beef this time, right? Yeah. And I also think that our relationship was very, I'm gonna say awkward. <laughs> it was just a little bit awkward growing up. My mom and I would be in a grocery store together and everyone would stare or people would ask questions. And my mom would sometimes turn around and just tell the whole story of our life. Right? Like, oh, this is my adopted daughter from China. And I know for her, it's a moment of joy and like happiness and, and for me too. Um, but for me, it also just felt really awkward all the time because in my head, like I just saw her as my mom. Like, why does she always talk about me as her adopted daughter. I felt like it was this distinction that we didn't have to keep making all the time because to me, she was just mom. I have like three, three ripe ones, two ripe ones in the fridge already. Okay. These ones are almost ripe. Okay. Avocado. I don't think that my mom ever intended to put any of her own expectations on me. I don't think I had expectations at all. My goal was to have her be a contributing, law-abiding citizen. She just always was an achiever and pushed herself. But I think that a lot of it was also me wanting to like be the best daughter that I could for her. Kind of went into this concept of me feeling like I owed her something because she adopted me and she never has ever explicitly said anything like that, right? But mass media, the predominant messaging of Asian babies getting adopted by um, someone in America is like, oh my God, they did such an amazing thing and look at how wonderful their lives are gonna be now and they must be so grateful and that this happened to them that now they have an opportunity that they never would have had uh, had they been in Asia. And so that was, I don't think necessarily something that she directly placed on me, but it was indirectly put on me by the environment, everything around us, and then my own kind of insecurities and 
and trauma and the way that it was showing up. I really hate it when everyone's like, oh, you're so blessed, like, God just really loves you. I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like, I, again, I kind of now I'll go into a gentle uh, perspective shift for them where I'll say something like, yes, absolutely. And I lost a family, I lost an identity, I lost a language, I lost a culture. So I do feel very grateful and I feel a lot of pain and sadness and anger towards it that you don't hear about a lot. And then that kind of shuts people up. Consuming a lot of East Asian media, specifically anime and like K-pop, really, really helped me, I think, build a sense of pride in being Asian. When I was in middle school, I found people online who liked it, while other people thought that they were really cool and that they're really beautiful. And then it kind of made me think, oh, like, do people view me like who I kind of look like them in a way? like? Does that mean I'm cool? Does that mean I'm pretty? Like things like that. And I think it just really helped improve my relationship with my mom and with my brother. Like she would write excused absences for me so I could go to concerts and things like that. And she would take me to the concerts and we'd go together and have a great time. As I got older, I really turned to Asian YouTubers to build my sense of self-confidence and just pride and like security in being Asian and being Asian American. My mom could not teach me how to do makeup because she's not Asian and we have very different features and everything like that. As a late 20 something year old, when I was going through uncovering my own adoptee identity, I really didn't have the tool of language to be able to express myself in any kind of way. And it really took consuming a lot of this type of media, reading books about adoptee experiences, um, listening to podcasts, watching documentaries. And it's so funny because I didn't even think about looking for them in the past, but just even realizing that they're there and then intentionally seeking them out and going into them with a mindset of wanting to learn helped me so much as an older adoptee then be able to take the language and adapt it to what um, I think fit my own personal experience so that then I could use it to talk to other adoptees and to even talk to other people who aren't adoptees and be able to connect to them and relate to them on a deeper level. Claiming that part of your identity for yourself, like I'm an adoptee, is empowering in that you're choosing it for yourself as opposed to saying I'm adopted, meaning this is something that happened to me and I have no control over it, even though that's still very much a part of one's identity. Some of my favorite memories are my mom. She used to like put me to bed every night and then I had a bunch of music boxes. Like I really liked these music boxes and I would always have a hard time sleeping, but she would always turn on the music boxes um, to help me sleep. And so usually by the time they ended, I would be asleep. And I remember too, as a, like a really young child, of course I have like severe <laughs> attachment issues and anxiety that I've been working through as an adult. But I remember when I couldn't sleep well on my own in my room, even with the music, I would always want to go sleep in her bed with her. Those were some moments when I really felt like connected to her, bonded to her um, as like her child. You're like, oh, we're sharing this bed together. We get to cuddle. 
we get to just like enjoy each other's presence and she helped me calm down as a child so that I could actually sleep because I knew that she was there and that's all that I really needed. This one is Mulan, and actually the song that it plays is Reflections. <laughs> 